Thanks for having me, everybody. Uh, my name is Derek O'Yang, and I'm here over on uh, the west coast of the U.S. where the sun's just coming up. Uh, curious if there's any other west coasters out there joining uh, right now. Um, so I uh, am a program manager, and I teach at uh, the Stanford Future Bay Initiative. And we're one of many activities uh, at Stanford. Um, we're pretty place-based. Uh, we work on messy urban systems analytics problems uh, in the Bay Area, the nine-county Bay Area, with uh, partners from the community level all the way up to the regional and, and, and uh, federal governmental level. And uh, just a sense of the kind of problems uh, we tackle on a day-to-day -day basis, which I suspect um, uh, align with many of the problems uh, many of you work on on a day-to-day -day basis with spatial data. Um, housing is a huge problem in the Bay Area, and we're partnered with the regional government entities to uh, just get the basic kind of reporting uh, working in a, in a um, useful and efficient queue where there's housing constructed every year. And in order to check whether we're meeting our housing goals, um, the regional governing entities will need some way to track that, uh, that upkeep and that, that construction and report those results back to the larger community. Uh, but that requires wrangling data sets potentially from 100 plus different cities together on a year to year basis and making sure that there aren't duplicates of records uh, as we report um, on a year to year basis. Another big problem we focus on here in the Bay Area uh, are climate impacts, especially on vulnerable communities. And one of the largest uh, climate risks uh, we're worried about is sea level rise. Uh, and there's work we're doing to uh, uh, intersect uh, flood hazard maps with building footprints and understand both the physical damages uh, that can be accrued with future flood events, as well as all the cascading socioeconomic impacts like business disruption and displacement and so forth. And that requires really heavy GIS modeling and close interaction with partners and trying to understand uh, impacts from uh, buildings to people to organizations, uh, which can require a lot of record linking as well. And then uh, really hitting home this year, we've actually spent most of our time on COVID-19 response, given that we're so partner oriented and all of our partners, counties, cities, nonprofits um, had to pivot to, to COVID-19, so did we. Um, and some of the most uh, rewarding work there has been uh, using mobility data to understand foot traffic and movement patterns in a way that can help cities and counties monitor social distancing compliance, understand what their blind spots are in terms of uh, mitigating community spread. And that's just been an entirely head down, deep, engaged work uh, with public health practitioners and community members. And just to kind of bring the point home uh, and to clarify uh, who I am here, I'm just a uh, hopefully a, a, a somebody working on GIS issues and, and spatial data issues on a day-to-day -day basis like many of you. It's only gotten more intense uh, this year uh, and, and clarified just how important fast, efficient, effective, accurate GIS work is for <clears throat> saving lives and for helping our, our local partners. So <clears throat> probably like you, I don't have time necessarily to play with new tools, to necessarily even attend spatial data conferences. Uh, because we're just trying to solve problems every day. Um, so all the more important that when there are roadblocks that can really waste time in the kind of work we do with messy administrative data and geospatial methods, then there's a huge cost to that. And it's so big of a cost that I really specifically want to show you a tool that I've um, been a part of advising and seeing over the last uh, few months here, uh, see it grow and, and get published and debuted that really saves time and, and can really mean huge impacts to the kind of work I'm doing and hopefully uh, for you as well. So that's why I'm presenting here. So what kind of uh, messy problem am I talking about uh, that is relating all of these three examples from my work? Um, linking place data, linking records, especially records of address and parcel based information. Um, here's three examples. You can see that they are entirely different worlds of data, but they all are attempting to mean the same place, some place called 123 Main Street, uh, where there might be a Starbucks there. Um, and you've got all kinds of problems that I'm sure you and I are familiar with, with uh, attempting to geocode and link these records if you're trying to do some set of insights that are uh, connecting the other information that's contained in these three different worlds. So these data may come from different places, um, maybe cross agency, maybe at different geographies. And how do we all do it today? Uh, you might attempt to clean up the addresses and use that as a, space, as a join uh, uh, field. Uh, you might use geocoding services that might have more and more sophisticated uh, machine learning methods built in. 
But the practical problem I think many of us have experienced is if you use an industry standard geocoder, uh, you might get uh, different points, uh, whether it's on the street edge of a parcel or right at the front door or where the lat long ping is or where the center of the building footprint is. And we might be stuck using our best heuristics to figure out if all of these separately located points are actually the same. Um, if we're lucky, we might have building footprints, but even building footprints uh, or other polygons might be slightly different. Um, so we still have to do some kind of heuristics to understand how these match. And the beauty of this new tool called Place Key is that it is a middle person in that process and can do a lot of that conceptual work around matching strings for addresses and other kinds of intelligence and produces a unique uh, key, as you can see here, and I'll explain in more detail what that's composed of, which then can be the drawing field. And from a practical level, this saves you a lot of time potentially with all the other methods that, that we're familiar with and banging our heads on the tables on to link these records together. So what's in a place key? Here's an example for the Space Needle in Seattle. And it really has two components. It's a what component before the at sign and then a where component afterwards. So um, the place key team likes to call this a what at where structure. And immediately this, this um, uh, got my attention because I often feel like there's a difficulty in linkage if you're only focused on the what or if you're only focused on the where. And to my knowledge, this is one of the first tools and services out there that is attempting to understand the combination of these two. So. Every place is inside of a where, which is using the H3 hex grid system. You can see an example of a hex in the image on the left. Um, but in particular, uh, this is uh, similar to a tool that, that Uber, Uber put together and uses. Um, and each hex is uh, about 60 kilometers or 200 feet uh, in, in, in length. So that's what the where component is. It isn't as granular as say lat long coordinates. Um, the what side is then um, some kind of three character encoding for the address. You can imagine there's only so many addresses that could exist inside of a hex grid. Um, and then there's also this point of interest, POI encoding for all the unique kinds of businesses or just proper noun kinds of places that could be sometimes in the same address or just generally in the where location. So by putting in a unique identifier for all three of these aspects, you get an even clearer sense of the unique uh, identity of places, which can then be joined using its various built-in string matching and, and geocoding techniques. I'll get to uh, uh, questions at, at the end of the session here. So it's ready to use today. Uh, you can go onto placekey.io, get an API key. This will require you to have some of the know-how of, of how to interact with uh, online services through an API whether that's using Python or R or another uh, language. Um, but there is a, a kind of user interface in which you can try this right now and type in some attributes of a place. You can put in location, address, city, state, zip code, uh, latitude, longitude, but not all of these fields are necessarily required. And it'll generate uh, a, an ID. All the service fundamentally does is it takes potential inputs on the left side and generates a place key. So then what you can do is feed a lot of potential messy inputs and then see if you get matching place keys. So notice here that it's on the left side, I'm now showing a few different uh, ways to um, write the addresses and the zip codes and the states. And that's a lot of that work that uh, place key as a free service is doing for us. Um, it can solve problems. Like you can see an example here of Tom's number five, Tom's no fives, chili burgers, chili dogs are understood to be the same place key. You can imagine this being a very difficult thing for a typical uh, string matching service. It can uh, identify that there are potentially slight errors with the address here, the actual street number, but with all the other contextual information, it does recognize that there was just an error in the address and th these are the same locations as well. Um, th this is a case in which there are actually two Starbucks nearby each other just across the street and place key uh, is um, intelligent enough to understand these to have different addresses. But as a Starbucks, it, they hold the same uh, POI encoding, the 222, and they also are within the same uh, hex uh, for the wire side. And uh, here is noting that even in the same address, like a, like a shopping mall kind of complex, uh, there are two separate stores, so they get the same address encoding, but different POI encodings. Uh, the difference between three words and this is just that three words would be something like the right side, but it wouldn't give you a sense of the information on the left side. 
So back to my example, um, the regional housing project um, involves uh, taking year by year surveys of these hundred plus cities, uh, asking them, hey, what new housing have you permitted or built uh, this year? And then using that data to, um, to uh, create uh, housing records. And uh, as uh, uh, the regional government itself uh, has done this well for the first uh, few years, but then they received a 2018 survey that was taken over by uh, the state housing department and it was a messy spreadsheet. They spent over a year trying to deduplicate, especially so that they're not incorrectly noting what new uh, um, housing uh, permits have been uh, built that year. And then in 2019, actually just uh, earlier this summer, they got the 2019 data and they are scared of having to do all the work over again. Um, we've tried to help them. And with a standard industry geocoder, you can only get unique geocodes uh, at long locations for less than 50% of either side. And then you're trying to see if there's linkage. So that introduces still all the same kind of uh, manual work involved. Just with the first shot with place key, I was able to get this up to over 75% matching. Um, and able to find more of those linkages between 2018 and 2019 so that we don't double count those housing records uh, in the new year. Uh, here's an example of just some of what those addresses ended up looking like. Um, and this is straight from cities, potentially asked, you know, just two years apart. And there were these kinds of issues where the APNs, the parcel numbers weren't matching, and there were typos and errors in, in the uh, address field. So uh, typos in the, in the city name. Somebody in, in Dublin was having a bad day when they were putting this together, probably in 2019, you can see uh, lane versus road and, and uh, you know, the typos on Trollin Lane and Kenwood Lane Road. Um, so these kinds of things contributed to the low matching uh, efficacy, um, but uh, were uh, no problem for place key um, and, and being able to do that join. And this just leads to faster work for housing, for the sustainability work we're doing, for COVID work. So get your free, free place key and go ahead and try it out uh, today. Um, there is good Python documentation for how to use the uh, API. Um, I personally use R uh, as does our team at Stanford. So happy to, if you reach out to me, I can share tips on how to set this up in R as well. And just remember, this is completely free, completely open. You're not uh, having to provide any of your own data to place key. It's just helping to do this matching service. You can use it for non-commercial and commercial purposes and all kinds of organizations have been uh, getting on board to, to help with this um, and really empower and, and infuse their own data sets with place keys to allow for that to be a common joiner all across these kinds of data sets. Um, so looking forward to uh, talking a bit more about this. Uh, I'm a strong supporter of this kind of service and I hope to be working with you guys with place key as a new tool in the next few years. I'll take questions uh, on stage or through the networking event uh, and thanks so much for having me.